Καλησπέρα σα. Να μου επιτρέψετε να κάνω μια σύντομη εισαγωγή στα αγγλικά για τον ομιλητή μα. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to welcome you this evening to the presentation on material computation in architecture to be given by our invited guest, Archimedes, architect and professor at the University of Stuttgart. The specific presentation comprises a special event because of two main reasons, among others. Firstly, this is the closing lecture of the Cyprus Architecture Lecture Series cycle of the last eight years. We do hope that the lecture series will be re-initiated in the near future. At this point, I would like to thank sincerely all co-organizing bodies of the series, the Department of Architecture of the University of Cyprus, the Scientific Technical Chamber of Cyprus, the Cyprus Civil Engineers and Architects Association, and the Cyprus Architects Association for the efficient and fruitful collaboration over the last years. The second reason for this presentation, being particularly significant, is the issue of concern on machine and material computation within the design process through the interdisciplinary approach followed by Professor Menges in teaching and research. A paradigm practice providing the perspective towards an intelligent, responsive, adaptive, and engaged sustainable architecture. Achim Menges is founding director, director of the Institute of Computational Design of the University of Stuttgart since 2008 and has been visiting professor in architecture at Harvard University, at the Architectural Association, and at Rice University. His practice and research focuses on the development of integral design processes at the intersection of morphogenetic design computation, biomimetic engineering, and computer-aided manufacturing and enables a highly articulated performative field environment. The significance, of, the significance of his work can hardly be overestimated. Indicative for this is his being internationally considered as the successor of Tyler in respective areas of research and advancement of architecture. I can thank you very much for having accepted our invitation to be here tonight with us to put it in the Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm not going to try to do the lecture in Greek, so you have to bear with me in English. Basically, what I thought I'm going to do tonight is um, give you a sort of small introduction into the theoretical sort of framework in which we try to conduct our research and work at the Institute, and then I will try to sort of outline that in a more sort of hands-on fashion through the presentation of four research projects that we have recently completed, which actually all happen somehow at the intersection of um, actually proper research and um, education endeavor um, entailing students. That's why I selected those two projects. In order to really understand what um, so the institute is about, and actually also the name of the institute, it's important to realize that when we refer to computation, we actually mean it in its kind of most basic sort of um, meaning. And that mean, that refers to the processing of information. And that's interesting because in this way, both machine processes that operate in the sort of binary realm of the digital and um, material processes that operate in a more complex domain of the physical can actually be considered as computation. <coughs> So um, what we really try to do is overcome this discrepancy between the digital and the material by inventing new processes where the computer is not seen as the dividing line between those two entities, but as something that actually intrinsically connects and sort of allows to synergize um, form generation and materialization architecture. So what is interesting is that obviously this approach is 
uh, not entirely new, and it has a number of interesting precedents, particularly in the kind of more radical and influential um, settings of German um, academic um, education. Um, and I will introduce these shortly in order to maybe also outline the kind of possible spectrum of work. So on the one hand, one could actually refer to Joseph Elbert's material studies and his focus at the Bauhaus in Dessau um, as establishing a precedent for the possible enrichment of the design process through what he actually called material experimentation. And it's interesting to note that Albers actually rejected established processes of materialization based on professional craft knowledge because he claimed that they actually stiffly invention. So instead, he identified the material behavior itself as the kind of creative domain for developing new modes of construction and innovation. And his um, material studies are really not conceived as scalar models or representations of ideas, but what usually as temporary unfoldings of material behavior in space and time. On the other sort of end of the spectrum, um, there are Fry Otto's extensive series of experiments that he conducted at his institute at the University of Stuttgart, and that he actually called form-finding um, experiments and methods um, that really investigated for the first time how physical computing, that is how actually material can organize itself in space. <laughs> Καλησπέρα σα. Να μου επιτρέψετε να κάνω μια σύντομη εισαγωγή στα αγγλικά για τον ομιλητή μα. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to welcome you this evening to the presentation on material computation in architecture to be given by our invited guest, Archie Makers, architect and professor at the University of Stuttgart. The specific presentation comprises a special event because of two main reasons, among others. Firstly, this is the closing lecture of the Cyprus Architecture Lecture Series cycle of the last eight years. We do hope that the lecture series will be reinitiated in the near future. At this point, I would like to thank sincerely all co organizing bodies of the series, the Department of Architecture of the University of Cyprus, the Scientific Technical Chamber of Cyprus, the Cyprus Civil Engineers and Architects Association, and the Cyprus Architects Association for the efficient and fruitful collaboration over the last years. The second reason for this presentation being particularly significant is the issue of concern on machine and material computation within the design process through the interdisciplinary approach followed by Professor Mendes in teaching and research. A paradigm practice providing the perspective towards an intelligent, responsive, adaptive and engaged sustainable architecture. Achim Mendes is founding director, director of the Institute of Computational Design of the University of Stuttgart since 2008 and has been visiting professor in architecture at Harvard University, at the Architectural Association and at Rice University. His practice and research focuses on the development of integral design processes at the intersection of morphogenetic design computation, biomimetic engineering and computer-aided manufacturing, and enables a highly articulated performative field environment. The significance, of, the significance of his work can hardly be overestimated. Indicative for this is his being internationally considered as the successor of Pilot in respective areas of research and advancement of architecture. I can thank you very much for having accepted our invitation to be here tonight with us before the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm not going to try to do the lecture in Greek, so you have to bear with me in English. 
basically what I thought I'm going to do tonight is um, give you a sort of small introduction into the theoretical sort of framework in which we try to conduct our research and work at the Institute. And then I will try to sort of outline that in a more sort of hands-on fashion through the presentation of four research projects that we have recently completed, which actually all happen somehow at the intersection of um, actually proper research and um, ed education endeavor um, entailing the students. That's why I selected those four projects. In order to really understand what um, sort of the institute is about, and actually also the name of the institute, it's important to realize that when we refer to computation, we actually mean it in its kind of most basic sort of um, meaning. And that mean, that refers to the processing of information. And that's interesting because in this way, both machine processes that operate in the sort of binary realm of the digital and um, material processes that operate in a more complex domain of the physical can actually be considered computation. <coughs> so um, what we really try to do is overcome this discrepancy between the digital and the material by inventing new processes where the computer is not seen as the dividing line between those two entities, but as something that actually intrinsically connects and sort of allows to synergize and form generation and materialization architecture. So what is interesting is that obviously this approach is uh, not entirely new and it has a number of interesting precedents, particularly in the kind of more radical and influential um, settings of German um, academic um, education. Um, and I will introduce these shortly in order to maybe also outline the kind of possible spectrum of work. So on the one hand, I want to actually refer to Joseph Elbert's material studies and his focus at the Bauhaus in Dessau um, as establishing a precedent for the possible enrichment of the design process through what he actually called material experimentation. And it's interesting to note that Albers actually rejected established processes of materialization based on professional craft knowledge because he claimed that they actually stiffly mentioned. So instead, he identified the material behavior itself as the kind of creative domain for developing new modes of construction and innovation. And his um, material studies are really not conceived as scalar models or representations of ideas, but what literally as temporary unfoldings of material behavior in space and time. On the other sort of end of the spectrum, um, there are Fry Otto's extensive series of experiments that he conducted at his institute at the University of Stuttgart, and that he actually called form-finding um, experiments and methods um, that really investigated for the first time how physical computing, that is how actually material can organize itself in space as a kind of um, ingredient, um, an essential ingredient of the architecture design process. So as you probably all know, Otto investigated a vast number of different material systems, such as, for example, the seminal soap films and related game maps that you can see here, in order to some, study their capacity to physically compute form as the equilibrium state of the kind of internal restraints and external forces. So, um, in many ways, within the contemporary context of design computation, I like to think of our work as a possible extension and synthesis of both sort of Albers' experimental approach of deploying material as a driving force in the creative process, and on the other hand, Otto's scientific rigor in conducting architectural inquiry. So what I will present today, as mentioned, are actually four projects, and these four projects will actually um, are used in order to illustrate four chapters of four aspects of our investigations, which would one can actually refer to as investigations that relate to materiality, materialization, material structure, and material performance, which may allow to think of a more sort of exploratory design culture and integrity material practice for architecture, even though I'm also aware that what we can offer right now is only a kind of modest beginning. So in the first chapter, I will focus on the notion of materiality with the aim of showing how such an approach to design computation 
allow us to understand the material not so much as a passive receptor or preconceived or pre-designed form, but rather as an active generator in the design process. And in order to show how such an approach allows exploring new facets, even of relatively mundane and commonplace building materials, I will focus the first part of the presentation actually on wood, um, which begs the question, why should one relate a hopefully innovative computation design process to what initially appears as a relatively archaic building material? But obviously, in the light of the environmental challenges that the built environment facing, it's increasingly recognized that <coughs> there are hardly any other construction materials that can rival Wood's environmental virtues, as it is a naturally renewable um, material that holds a very low level of renewable energy and has even a positive carbon footprint. However, in contrast to most other construction materials that are very specifically designed and produced for the um, building sector, and especially to satisfy the requirements of the building sector, wood obviously grows as the functional tissue of trees, resulting in a much more sort of differentiated and complex uh, internal structure. However, the design opportunities that are innate to this differentiated internal cellular structure of wood are usually completely neglected in today's construction practice, and wood is quite literally dumped down to just another <coughs> dimension of building element, uh, with the US naming convention being probably most emblematic of this disregard of the sort of material sophistication, where wood is not even called wood anymore, it's just called two by two, two by four, um, whatever. So in contrast to this, um, the computation processes that we employ allow for a renewed appreciation of the quite amazing um, sort of differentiation and behavioral capacities that sort of are related to Wood's complex anatomy. So all the design research projects that I will show and almost all the design research projects that they actually do begin with the investigation of the material structure on the microscopic level. And on that level, um, one can actually describe Wood as a natural fiber composite material. Because in the various layers of the Wood cells, which are 95% actually aligned with system axis, the cellulosic microfibrils function like fibers that are reinforced in a matrix of lignin and hemicellulose. Uh, and it's interesting to note that, as such, wood also shares a whole number of properties with more synthetic composites that we all know as sort of glass fiber reinforced plastics or carbon fiber reinforced plastics. And they are all characterized by relatively low stiffness combined with a high structure capacity. Which, in other words, means that these properties lend themselves um, to construction techniques that employ the elasticity of the material to form complex, lightweight structures from initially very simple elements. So, um, that obviously begs the question how can one really imagine an architectural design process that enables this material behavior to become an active tri driver? the generation of form structure and space. And this is a kind of research question that we try to investigate. Um, well, the first project that I want to show is the stability of the overall system, which you can see at the bottom. This is kind of two di two dimensional representation of the irregularity of the distribution of the um, John points. Um, this was again um, verified with a finite element analysis that simulates exactly the, the process of bending the initially planar strips, the subsequent cutting of the related segments, and then finds the final shape of the structure as the equilibrium between all interacting elastic elements. So I think this simulation really shows well how the behavior of the employed material really computes the related shape. Obviously, the structurally required irregularity then results in a multitude of different parts, in this case 500 geometrically sort of unique building elements that um, could be directly manufactured with the industrial robot because this is all happening in one digital chain. And what I find particularly interesting about this project is that in contrast to let's say the substantial intellectual investment in developing the kind of design, computation and simulation process which entails six PhD students, the actual final system 
and assembly is incredibly straightforward. You basically show up with the camera strips on site and you just need to connect them, no special tools, no scaffolds, no nothing. And then they find their specific shape entirely by themselves. So in other words, even in full scale on site, the material itself computes the shape of the pavilion. And this equilibrium state of the pavilion, on one hand, unfolds by a unique architectural space, but on the other hand, it is also extremely efficient with the employed material resources. Because the combination of the pre-stress that results from the elastic bending and the morphological differentiation of the joint locations allows using only extremely thin plywood. In fact, the entire structure, which had a diameter of more than 12 meters, could be constructed by only using birch plywood with a thickness of 6 millimeters. So it's not a thin building part that's thicker than 6 millimeters. So this super thin skin um, is at the same time the load bearing structure, which also needed to fulfill um, the quite stringent regulations of a German building application. For all these pavilions that I'm going to show you, you need to have a German building application, and they have to actually fulfill all the additional requirements in regards to wind loads, snow loads, etc., because they are set up in a public place. And it's not only the structure, but it's also the kind of light modulating and weather protecting. Which in this case touched the ground topography on the street facing corner in order to define sort of the edge of the university campus. And on the other side, it kind of creates an eight meter wide free span open. So inside, the toroidal space is actually interesting because it could never be perceived in its entirety, which leads to a surprising spatial depth that is further enhanced by the sequence of direct and indirect that results from the convex and concave undulations of the angle. In addition to, let's say, these more design-oriented explorations of the main architectural possibilities, the construction of these research projects also allows us a more scientific verification of the presented computation time approach, which in this case was done by comparing these four models. So what you see here is actually the computation design model up on the left, this is something there for which we wrote kind of six and a half thousand line piece of code computed. Then on the upper right, you see the actual material simulation based on final elements. On the bottom left, this is the fabrication model. And on the bottom right, this is the most critical item. This is a kind of full scale, three dimensional scan of the structure as constructed on site. So with the help of an institute for geodesic engineering, we digitize the entire structure by using um, this kind of laser scan equipment, which resulted in a huge point cloud. But from that, we were able to extract the crucial measure points that we then overlaid with the computation design model. And we're very happy to see that this only showed very minor deviations. So, comparing the results of the generative computation design process, as you can see up here with the digital model, with the actual measurements, exact measurements of the structure on site, which is the bottom um, 3D scan, um, shows that um, sort of the suggestive integration of material behavior and design computation is not an ionized goal, but really a feasible proposition. Maybe more importantly, the project also demonstrates how focusing the computation design process on material behavior rather than geometric shape, allows for unfolding performative capacity and material resourcefulness, while at the same time expanding the design space towards formerly unexplored architectural possibilities. And I think we can really say that here, material is no longer a passive receptor of shape, but an active generator of design. So in addition to these design potentials of martial reality, um, another aspect that we repeatedly explore is um, the novel ways of materialization, which are usually referred to in architectures of um, fabrication, production, and construction. And I think there's no question that numerically controlled processes have already had a kind of major effect on architectural production. Uh, but most often, the use of digital fabrication is really more facilitative than generative. So what we are interested in is seeing 
bought a machine like this industrial robot that has been used in the automotive industry for almost 40 years now can actually do an architecture and how we can actually use the possible, how we can actually strategically and sort of integrate its manufacturing possibilities in the design process. And for that, we actually investigated a mathematical concept that is called morphospaces, and that comes from theoretical morphology and biology, and have transferred that to computational design and fabrication. And it's actually quite interesting that in the early 1960s, there was a paleontologist uh, called David Rao, who published quite a seminal paper in science in which he presented a series of computer generated shape forms, which you can see on the map here. So this is in 1963, sort of almost at the same time that the first architect ever, ever got his hand onto a computer. Biology is already generating complex three dimensions stuff. Uh, but what is more remarkable is, um, is that he then went on to actually build a three dimensional space based on the three parameters that he used in order to generate these shape forms. And he mapped into that space. Um, all the kind of shells that he computationally derived and compared them to the ones that actually exist in nature. And in that way, he actually came up with a kind of mathematical method to this sort of differentiate between the shapes that actually exist, which is the empirical morphospace, space, and the shapes that could exist, which is the theoretical morphospace. space. So today, Theoretical morphology has moved on and is talking about huge n dimensional spaces that are actually capable of mathematically describing not yet existing form. So, in the next project, we actually try to transfer this concept of morphospaces into the realm of digital fabrication. And, and this again, uh, a research project that we um, completed in 2011. Um, again, a kind of collaborative effort between my institute, the Institute of uh, Young Clippers, uh, and that was in collaboration with our partners from the Competence Network Biomedics, which includes material scientists and biologists, and especially sort of biologists with a focus on biomechanics. So this project initially investigated how digital production processes allow for an extension of very traditional wood jointing techniques by developing robotically fabricated finger joints that you can see here on the right that make it possible to join plates at various, sort of various angles and with different plate thicknesses resulting in complex plate structures that still maintain the traditional finger joint advantage which is that it doesn't require any additional mechanical fasteners or adhesives you can basically just put it together so Based on our specific robot setup, which is this industrial robot, in this case also equipped with an additional robot control turntable that you can see on the left, um, we began to identify a number of critical morphological parameters of the finger joint blades, and by actually using a developing kind of manufacturing simulation, we were able to establish the kind of min-max range for these morphological parameters and map them into what we have termed a machine morphospace. So within the theoretical morphospace of all geometrically possible plates, plate morphologies, the actual machine morphospace emerges that only includes the plates that are actually fabricable with that particular machine setup. In this context, um, it's interesting to note this quote by biomedic engineer Julie Vincent, who stated that in biology, material is expensive, but shape is cheap. And as of today, the opposite was true in the case of technology. Obviously, with robotic fabrication, one would say that this is about to change. And thus, we thought that biomedic design strategies seem to be particularly promising to explore and cover of the performing regions within this machine model space. If you want to do that, you need to really understand how these um, finger joints actually do behave. And again, it's not sort of um, extremely complicated structural engineering knowledge that you need to have because you can imagine that these finger joints are very good in withstanding shear forces along the edges. So if you do this, they're very good at sort of withstanding these forces. 
they are very weak in bending because they're almost like hinges and they cannot withstand any tensile forces. So um, given that they can really only deal with shear forces, um, it's actually quite a problem if you want to design a larger plate structure that only is hope was only held together by these um, human joints. However, there are actually natural systems that, that have evolved ways of successfully addressing exactly this challenge. For example, the sand dollar, which you can see on this image, and which is actually a kind of specific sea urgent, has actually a plate skeleton um, that consists of discrete polygonal plates, and these plates are connected by stereo projections that are very similar to finger joints, and they behave mechanically in exactly the same way. So that means that the Sandella must have evolved or developed plate morphologies that fully capitalize on the finger joints capacity by basically evolving shells that transfer all the forces that are acting on them, and these are considerable so, uh, forces because they live in the surf on the beach, um, sort of transfer all these forces into normal and shear forces along the plate edges. And by that, the sand dollar uh, actually almost entirely avoids bending moments at these connections. So having discovered this biological example, um, we worked with biologists to identify eight relevant biomedic design principles that govern this performing capacity and capture them in algorithmic design rules that were embedded in a computational um, process. And this process still allows for quite a high degree of spatial modulation, for example, through um, topological manipulations such as the infolding and splitting that you can see here. And at the same time, they still ensure the consistency with the quite complex relations between what is actually producible and what is performative on the other hand, which in this case was iteratively tested and calibrated. So the resultant computation process enables the designer to explore the machinic morphospace of the physically producible through the filter of biomedic rules, which in concert with other spatial contextual criteria leads to a highly specific plate morphology. And um, this plate morphology and its articulation uh, of the envelope <coughs> results in uh, a particular high structural um, performance and quite a distinctive architectural character, which both stems from the morphological differentiation of the plate system. Same story as the other pavilion. Um, obviously, this differentiation then requires the fabrication of a huge number of different parts. In this case, more than 850 different plates with more than 100,000 different finger joints of which you can see a spatial mapping here, but because the logics of the materialization with the machine are already embedded in the design process, um, the necessary sort of generation of the robot control code is actually not an addition sort of hazard. It's actually it's sort of intrinsically embedded, um, which means that you can actually extract from the design model the machine control code to produce um, <coughs> um, the, the actual pieces, which you can see in this video. So here the, the plate is already trimmed, which happened just before, uh, mounted on this robotically controlled turntable, and then the robot actually begins to add the finger joints in a second. You can probably also get a sense that the control of such a machine, for which no standard software exists, and you have to write the robot control yourself, um, is not a trivial undertaking, because all the seven axes move at the same time. You can also see that it's a pretty fast process, so one plate takes about three minutes to produce, and it's incredibly precise because the, the precision is given by a tool, and that's precise down to a tenth of a minute. So, in the end, again, um, in contrast to this considerable complexity of the design process, and especially also to the kind of control engineering of the machine, the resulting system is surprisingly simple and also very cheap. Basically, you end up with a huge puzzle of finger joint plates 
that can be assembled into individual modules without the need for, for any special tools or heavy technical equipment. And although all the individual blades are very thin, um, the modules then demonstrate a considerable sort of structure capacity while being very lightweight. You can also get a sense of the kind of geometric difference that all these elements had. Um, and despite sort of the wide range of different geometries, we were confident enough that the position of the robot is high enough to actually build the system from the bottom up, which is very unusual. You would never do that in building construction because if you sort of assemble a shell from the, from the bottom up and your last piece doesn't fit, then you have a serious problem. Usually you build the entire shell and you compensate tolerances. In this case, we just build it from, from the bottom up and we are um, so, so happy to see that actually everything fit extremely well together, um, which was again corroborated by um, a full laser scan of the structure. So here you can actually see the resolution of this laser scan. It's almost like a three-dimensional photograph. So we did a full tolerance analysis down to the tolerance of the actual thing that John's fitting together. Uh, and yet, yet again showing that these processes are far more precise than anything to do with current timber construction. So the resulting lightweight modular woodshed demonstrates both the structural capacity and the architectural possibilities of a system that exclusively consists of extremely thin glider plates that are only connected by these robotically fabricated unit joints. So based on the systematic exploration of the machine in multiple space, the system reveals the spatial capacity to overcome the usually quite hermetic character of other shared structures. And it does so by also allowing the articulation of two quite distinct spaces that you can see in this image on the right. There's the truly internal space that has a double layer, which needs a perforation on the inside in order to be able to connect the modules. Um, and on the other side, the, this double layer skin is almost pulled apart, and that way reveals the structural logics of the system because it doesn't have this kind of perforated inner skin. Uh, which was further enhanced um, at night time through an indirect LED illumination that we added to each individual module. So as the structure performs here really results from each element's very specific response um, to, the, to the force it is exposed to, the entire pavilion, uh, which in this case had again a diameter of more than 12 meters and was more than 5 meters high, could be used, could be built using uh, again, extremely thin plates. So all the plates, without any exception, this structure have again a thickness of only 6.0 millimeters, um, which means it, uh, you get an extremely materially efficient structure that manages actually to enclose more than 200 cubic meters of space with only two cubic meters of wood. And I think you get an impression of the, the kind of architectural result, which if you turn out to be a extremely popular uh, site for all kinds of informal urban activities. And I think overall the project quite nicely shows how embedding the logics of the materialization within a kind of morphogenetic computation process enables the designer to offset the sort of conventional economies of construction. Here, a substantial investment is made intellectually in the design process that then again results in a surprisingly simple system that yet again yields novel architectural possibilities while at the same time offering a high level of material efficiency and performance capacity. What you probably can also sense is that this project still follows a relatively conventional mode of construction where a larger system is built up from individual elements. Uh, but this is actually something that's fairly unusual in nature. Um, usually, most biological systems follow a very different logic, in which a clear distinction between what is material and what is structure is not even possible. Um, most of the time here, much reality is really constructed as an integrative material structure of continuous elements that are organized across multiple scales of hierarchy. And this is the sort of focus of the third part of our research that I would like to introduce 
um, by showing the example of our latest um, research pavilion, um, which different to the previous pavilion that I just showed, um, which was built up as a shell from different shaded yet discrete modular elements. Um, here, the goal was really to build an absolutely continuous shell in which the match reality itself is different shaded to respond to different structural forces. And an interesting natural example of such a structure is the exoskeleton of the American lobster. So at first glance, if you ever had a lobster, there's actually cooked lobster, that's why it's red. Um, if you ever had a lobster, you know that um, the different parts of the exoskeleton, which is called the cuticula, actually have very different material properties. Um, although everything is basically one material. Um, and the reason for that is revealed again on the microscopic level, uh, where you can see that what initially appears as a monolithic shell is actually a highly differentiated structure that is organized across several <coughs> levels of hierarchy. And all, as I mentioned, everything is essentially one material, which is again a kind of natural fiber composite material of chitin fibers that are embedded in the protein matrix. The kind of differentiation in the microstructure, the layer of the fibers, allows the kind of lobster to sort of very specifically tune its exoskeleton to its kind of specific regional load bearing requirements. And this is sort of the engineering diagram of what you experience if you eat a lobster, that there are parts that are extremely stiff, like the crusher claws, and there are parts that are made from the same material that are very weak, or let's say very actually elastic, um, like the connective membranes at the tail. And uh, this is all achieved by differentiation of the fibers um, in the fiber layout and some sort of changes to the protein matrix. So in collaboration with the biologists, um, our students and researchers carefully investigated different parts of the lobster shell which have these different properties um, and studied them again under the microscope to identify different fiber organizations such as strongly parallel fiber arrangements or more helicoidal fiber structures as well as sort of complex situations in which the kind of cuticula almost forms inch line situations. And because the logic of these natural composite materials is quite closely related to sort of fiber reinforced plastics in technology, we began to investigate at the same time new manufacturing technologies for glass and carbon fiber composites, such as for example the North Face technology that you can see here on the right, where for advanced racing yards, um, the sales are actually produced in a way that every fiber is laid individually um, in correspondence with the actual force flow on the sale. Um, this is actually not an entire new process anymore, it's almost 10 years old. So the idea of um, sort of unique fiber placement is something that is, uh, has been around for a while. But obviously the problem is that this technology is not really suited for architecture because it requires you to build a huge comprehensive mold on which you can then make your fibers. So what we try to do is develop a different process, um, which we call robotic film winding, which actually is based on a very sort of minimal linear frame that you can see here. And then we actually begin to wind the fibers around that frame. And the, the kind of foam work or the mold is constructed in the process of constructing the actual shell. So once we had established the quite intricate um, robot programming of how we actually lay the fibers onto such a framework, which has the main challenge of creating a kind of continuous or sort of, uh, continuous pretension within fibers, <coughs> we also had to conduct a whole number of material tests because here you cannot any longer <coughs> look up the material properties in the textbook because you actually construct new material properties by constructing the material structure itself. So based on these uh, load-bearing tests of the material um, and the biological principles, 
we then related different regions of fiber organization in the overall logic of the robotic filament, filament line process, of which you can see here actually the physical model that indicates the different regions of the carbon fiber here in black and um, glass fiber here shown in white. Um, and the way they are organized such as for example a region of more unidirectional carbon fiber arrangements at the support points or more helicoidal glass fiber organizations as in lobster shell in zones where uh, the surface is more kind of spatially wider rather than a load bearing region. Again, this was iteratively checked through structural simulations and through that um, we were able to establish an entire syntax of fiber placement um, that allows us to articulate quite different architectural situations such as an entrance location, as you can see here, or a particular roof morphology, which then resulted in a kind of comprehensive method for developing a design technique <coughs> that unfolds quite a rich repertoire of possible architectural morphologies, while at the same time remaining coherent with the logics and constraints of this robotic film and process. So because you can imagine, once you actually begin to lay these carbon fibers onto a scaffold, every additional fiber that you lay interacts with all the fibers that are already there, which means that the relationship between form, material, the behavior of the material, and the then resultant form is relatively complex. So in this case, we actually had to do an entire simulation of the manufacturing process are mainly in order to establish which is something that you can't see here not as projector is not bright enough, but, um, in order to establish exactly with how much tension, so how much, how much pre-stress you need to lay the fibers onto the scaffold in each individual step. Um, we also did a bit of actually engineers at um, the Kimpers Institute did quite a bit of engineer so opti engineering optimization so that we could build uh, uh, maximum stiffness shell with the minimum amount of fibers. What's also interesting is that compared to the previous two pavilions um, that we could actually produce within our own robotic manufacturing lab, this project required a far more evolving fabrication setup where the pavilions actually produced on this temporary steel scaffold by a much, much larger robot that actually has a deformity on the arm. So, um, in this here you see the manufacturing setup. Um, we had to build a tent because the materials are a bit sort of humidity sensitive. And within the tent, we have the robotically controlled turntable, which is hard to see. And on the turntable, you have the steel scaffold that's obviously taken out after the shell is constructed and could be actually reused to build uh, more shells. And we actually tend to reuse it, and that's why we have the, the final extension of the scaffold is the steel bits which you could change, and by that you could also change the geometry of the next pavilion you must try. So after figuring all this out, and also scanning the scaffold um, with the robot in order to compensate for tolerances that occur in the manufacturing process, um, one late night in August, this whole thing started to spin, and the first glass fiber rollings were laid onto the scaffold, as you can see in this video. So, the shell rotates around the robot, so the shell rotates and the robot lays the fibers individually on the best. You can also see that this is a fully automized process. All the guys have their hands in the pocket, um, including nothing basically just watching. A couple of days later, it looks like this. So the first layer of glass fiber is actually made. And um, this layer of glass fiber, which is this white glossy material that you can see, becomes the actual formwork onto which the actual structural carbon fiber is subsequently laid. And you can also see right now, for example, that the curvature that the carbon fiber then takes on is um, quite a complex uh, sort of shape, and this all needs to be sort of pre-computed um, in its interaction with the uh, sort of previously laid. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
So these are try runs, the actual fabrication process. Um, you can see the, the fiber roll on the left. The fiber runs through resin bars, so it's saturated with resin, and then it runs through the kind of effector head of the robot and it's laid onto the um, laid onto the steel scaffold, which um, in the video looks like this. So um, at that point, a couple of layers are already produced, and here you can see how the, the wet fibers are made, building up incrementally um, this shell. Um, where the, the curing time of the resin is such, set in such a way that it always glues on to the next shell in the similar process. That's from the perspective of the robot. Yeah. There's a guy that does a lot of quality control inside. Not a nice job. The entire application process for this for this will be um, took 120 hours. So um, without so if, without including all the development time, you could build something like this in a week or two. I think in many ways this project quite nicely shows how robotic fabrication begins to significantly expand the design space of the architect um, beyond the design of form, space, and structure towards the actual design of the processes from which form, space, and structure is derived. And this includes the development and exploration of novel material construction systems. In this case, the final shell consists of more than 60 kilometers of robotically laid carbon glass fiber, but it's kind of like its final state only 4 millimeter thin and really extremely lightweight. Um, the entire shell weighs less than 300 kilos, which means that you have actually a ratio of one half of uh, less than 5 kilos per square meter, which in Germany is classified as ultra lightweight structure. And I think that becomes also sort of visible. Um, on the inside, where quite an outstanding level of transparency and the intricacy of the resulting surfaces is revealed, that almost make the kind of glass fiber surfaces disappear. So, synthesizing the capability of the machine with building up the material structure itself, the transparent glass fiber surfaces and the actually structural black carbon fiber rollings really allow to perceive the logic of the differentiated fibers organization within a translucent envelope of the pavilion, all forming more or less one continuously constructed much reality. So no addition element. So here, the construction logics establish both, on one hand, a super thin, highly performative material structure, and on the other hand, a kind of novel repertoire of architecture morphologies. So the synthesis of novel modes of computation and material design, rigid simulation and robotic fabrication allows for an exploration, architecture exploration that somewhat overcomes the contemporary discrepancy between what is quite often referred to as sort of architecturally performative and on the other hand sort of structurally performance. So here um, let's say uh, ex architecture expressiveness does not mean exuberance relation to employed material sort of resources. So after having introduced the design possibilities inherent in designing and constructing synthetic materiality, I will return for one last, for the last chapter um, to wood again um, in order to show how such material form computation design processes allow for sort of exploring uh, performative capacity that is later even in such commonplace materials as wood. And actually, we've done um, a whole series of projects over the last five, six years that have investigated how one can tap into inherent environmental responsiveness of wood, which is one of the most common and actually still one of the cheapest construction materials we have. 
as probably all of you know, wood is called a hygroscopic material, which means it maintains its moisture content in equilibrium with the surrounding weather of humidity. And this, the related processes of adsorbing and desorbing water molecules affect the microfibular structure, which results in both change in strengths and a differential change of dimension. Usually, we sort of experience this dimension of instability of wood as an efficiency, because we have jammed drawers or wobbly parquet floors and all these things, and one could argue that we have about 4,000 years of craftsmanship in order to avoid wood doing what it always wants to do and that is swelling and shrinking. And in fact, we invest more than 70% of the energy in wood processing to suppress this sort of material in hand behavior, which you can see here. So in order to stabilize wood somewhat, we actually put it in a kiln and dry it, and this is the major energy that is spent in wood processing. So in this project, we were interested in doing somewhat exactly the opposite by exploring this climate responsive capacity of wood. And for that, it's important to remember that climate responsiveness in architecture is usually conceived as a kind of technical functionality that is enabled by myriad mechanical and electronic devices. And in contrast to the superimposition of high tech equipment on otherwise quite inert and dump building materials, our approach investigates quite a fundamentally different strategy, which one could actually call it more tech. Here, the climate responsiveness is quite literally ingrained in the material itself. Again, there are natural examples of such responsive structures, such as the spruce cone, which grows in a moist, closed state, as you can see here on the left, and then actually falls off the tree, and once the surrounding environment has reached suitably dry environmental condition, um, it kind of completely by itself opens its scales, um, due to the differential shrinkage of the fiber structure during the reduction in moisture content. It's interesting to note that the cone does that thousands of times, actually without any fatigue. We have measured it for a couple of thousand cycles. And this is interesting because the biological function is fulfilled once it, once it has opened once, and then the seeds are released. But because it's a kind of material inherent behavior, it is far more difficult for the cone to stop doing this than we just keep on keep on going. So what we did is we so extracted this um, principle of translating the dimensional change into a shape change and developed a climate responsive composite element in which wood is still sort of the intelligent or responsive or reactive layer. So I think this video shows quite nicely how changes in relative humidity see on the hygrometer at the bottom left, um, trigger this uh, very thin element to actually change its shape. Um, and it does so, again, over hundreds and hundreds of cycles. They actually have tested these elements um, in terms of their reliability and also in regard to their robustness. And they are extremely robust because this is a composite material. So if you hit it with a hammer, which you have done, um, it just turns the other way undergoes another humidity change cycle and it's back to where it was before. <coughs> um, the last couple of years, we have also um, managed to actually physically program the material to actually respond quite differently to different environmental stimuli. So for example, in this video, you can see two um, prototypes. They are exactly the same material. Um, exactly the same manufacturing process, only a couple of variables in the manufacturing process can change, and that means that they sort of respond to exactly the same environmental input, which is the change of humidity, in opposite ways. So the one, uh, I think the one on the right, actually opens with an increase in relative humidity, and the one on the left closes with an increase in relative humidity. Although everything is still pretty much the same material. Um, we have tested this behavior in a number of full-scale function mock-ups and verified the coherent fee through a number of research projects, both laboratory tests, and we have actually conducted long-term tests for more than two years by now, monitoring the system 
and, it's, and, uh, and the environmental conditions every 15 minutes. And we are happy to report that um, the system still performs absolutely faultlessly. Uh, it's actually situated on the top of our 20 story high rise building in the outside environment. But every time rain approaches, relative humidity always rises. And that means that the system reliably closes and it has done so by thousands of cycles per month. At the same time, um, and accounting for the more complex reciprocity of the individual element as well as the overall system responsiveness, we have developed a more adaptive morphological system and a related computation design process in which we can integrate the specific anatomy of the piece that we want to use, um, which in this case resulted in a fully functional prototype. So here, the near composite pieces are at the same time the sensor, the motor, and the regulated elements. And given the change in relative humidity, as you can see nicely in this video, the system opens and closes with no need for any supply of external energy or any kind of additional mechanical or electronic control. It is really just a very simple wood composite system, and the responsiveness is quite literally ingrained in the material itself. And as we speak, we've just completed a, a larger sort of pavilion project um, for the permanent collection of the Frux Center in France that features actually a skin like this, which on rainy days with relatively high ambient humidity has a fully closed envelope, but once the weather changes and the sun comes out, the related degrees of relative ambient humidity automatically triggers the structure to open. And I think beyond fulfilling the merely sort of functional requirements of a climate responsive skin, this autonomous passive actuation of the surface actually provides quite a unique convergence of environmental and spatial experiences. Um, unfortunately, I cannot show you any additional photos of that project because I'm not supposed to show anything until the opening of it uh, in September. But um, in the meantime, we also had the chance to develop this system further um, by a commission um, of the Centre Pompidou in Paris um, for an installation for a permanent collection which we named Hyperscope Petrosensitive Morphology. So in many ways, the Centre Pompidou in Paris obviously embodies the architectural opposites to our approach. In fact, the entire building celebrates the very technology that maintains a stable interior climate as one of its key architectural features. Most of the stuff that you see is actually climate conditioning, and it's kind of the, the, one of the key sort of architectural expressions for the Centre Pompidou. So, because of, because of that, our concept for this installation was to insert into the space of the Centre Pompidou, which is arguably one of the most climatically stable interiors in the world, always maintaining exactly 21 uh, degrees and 50% relative humidity, uh, a kind of virtual extension of the exterior climate in the form of a large display case, which you can see here on the first floor of the Pompidou, where this installation was actually shown, in which we then reproduce the dynamics of the external environment in Paris. So within this glass case, the movement of this metrosensitive morphology allows the visitor to experience the subtle humidity fluctuations that form part of our everyday life, but usually completely escape our spatial conception. In this case, the very specific system morphology is actually computationally derived based on the system intrinsic material variables, the anatomy of the wood pieces that we're going to use, and um, sort of the extrinsic environmental conditions, which in this case are simulated by our project partners, which are client engineers um, of the company Transcelar. Um, in Stuttgart. And here you can nicely see how the humidity sort of distribution, even within such a controlled environment as this glass box, is extremely hetero heterogeneous. And this heterogeneity drives the um, articulation of the morphology, which basically resulted in three concentration points that respond quite differently um, to an increase in relative humidity. So as it happens, um, 
we also usually produce um, all these installations in-house. So in this case, this entails fairly elaborate robotic fabrication and substructure. And we're also quite proud that we sort of produce all the responsive material in our lab. Um, where you can see that this is actually a pretty in, uh, uh, sort of involving process because you have to monitor the humidity from production of material to assembly to transport and the setup on site. Um, as you can see here, everything needs to happen within these kind of humidity controlled environments. And um, as you could not find a company that was willing to do the job for us, we also had the interesting task to build this custom. Um, fabricated um, climate control unit that you can see here on the left, which is a sort of mini Centre Pompidou underneath the display case that somewhat undoes what the big Centre Pompidou does in terms of climate conditioning. So through this unit, we actually can reproduce the outside environment within that case. So following quite a bit of fine tuning to get this properly set up, um, the final installation really explores a novel mode of responsive architecture by unfolding material inherent performing capacities. Here, the material continuously recomputes form and performance in feedback with the environment. So, within the glass case, the climate, as mentioned before, responds to an accelerated database of the relative humidity in Paris. And thus, the case actually functions less as a separation from the interior space of the Pompidou but rather as a, as a virtual extension or connection to the outside environment of Paris. And the perception of the ever-changing and locally varied environmental dynamics is intensified through the very silent movement of the responsive morphology. And in this way, the installation provides a visual, almost a tangible experience of the subtle variations in humidity levels that we hardly ever consciously perceive. So suspended within this humidity control glass case, the system responds to climatic fluctuations and the mere increase in relative humidity triggers the system to change its surface porosity, in this case by opening and almost breathing and ventilating the moisture saturated air. So here, the very simple wooden morphology embodies the capacity to sense, actually respond with no need for any additional electronic or mechanical equipment or even supply of external energy. So I think one can really say that here the material itself is the machine. Mm -hmm.